during these few minutes of silence. You can focus on something you're grateful for, someone you are remembering especially today, or simply just the pace of your breath, your feeling of your body and your chair. Will you find a more comfortable place in your seat? Just take a few easy breaths as we settle into the shared silence together. May I be light in you. May you be light in me. Into our hearts, into our souls, let love abide. May I be loved in you. May you be loved in me from this place out to the world for all time. Spirit of life, sources of all that ever was and can be, we are guided by all that is sacred within our own hearts and minds to pray this prayer and to live this prayer. We offer up this simple and profound hope that we may be light, give light, and receive light in all the places we call home and in this sacred space that reaches across miles and experiences that we may be love, give love, and receive love out in the world. May we never forget the impact and power of our voices. May we never lose sight of the songs in our hearts. D. Blanchard reminds us that they can be heard as songs of love or of longing, songs of encouragement or of comfort, songs of struggle or of security, 
care. But most of all, they are the songs of life, giving testimony to what has been, giving praise for all we're given, giving hope for all we strive for, and giving voice to the great mystery that carries each of us in and out of this world. Today, we hear those songs in all the ways we are learning and growing as communities of faith, hope, and love. We hear them as, as little ones become young ones. We hear them as loved ones pass from this life and into the unknown. And we hear them in the streets and at our polling places as people of faith and conscience pave the way for a better world a better understanding, deeper care and accountability. And we hear them in the silences, a deep awareness that there are those among us as yet unheard and unaccounted for. May we never ever forget the impact and the power of our voices, may we never, ever lose sight of the songs in our hearts. May grace and mercy follow us wherever we may go, whatever we, may, we feel called to and toward in the days and weeks ahead. Amen. Ashe and blessed be. Amen. Our sermon this morning is a video from the president of our Unitarian Universalist Association, the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray. And so we listen together to her words this morning. I invite you in particular to listen to the encouragement she offers to you and also to listen possibly for a challenge. It seems like we might have a tech issue here. One second. It's foundation. I was 13 years old when I became a Unitarian Universalist. I was raised in this faith, but I was 13 when I claimed it as my own. It was a Sunday afternoon, and I was waiting for my parents to finish their committee meetings after service. All the other kids had left, and I was bored. I wandered into the visitor's corner, and a little red wallet card caught my eye. It said in bold letters on the front, what do Unitarian Universalists believe? 
My 13-year-old self wondered, what do Unitarian Universalists believe? As I read the 10 statements written by the Reverend David O'Rankin, in my heart, in my soul, as I read those words, I said, yes, this is what I believe. One phrase in particular planted itself in me like the deepest truth, and I never forgot it. We believe in the motive force of love. It was in that moment when I knew that this was my religion. I start with this story to ground the work of You, You, The Vote in our theology, which is its foundation and its inspiration. This year marks the 250th anniversary of what we celebrate as the beginning of universalism in the United States. It was on September 30th, 1770, that universalist John Murray preached his first sermon on this continent. And the truth that I read in that little red wallet card, the truth I've never forgotten, is the message of universalism. 250 years ago, in the context of religious notions of God rooted in punishment, damnation, and the division of humanity between worthy and unworthy, saved and damned, the idea of universal salvation, that God's love is unconditional, that no one is cast out, and that salvation is not individual but collective, was radical and liberating. Universalism proclaimed that humanity was bound together in a common destiny and that love, love is the thread that binds each of us to the other and everyone to creation. Universalists believe that God is love. They also believed in hell. They just believed that it existed here and now on the earth. The great universalist preacher Hosea Ballou was clear about how politicians and those in power used fear, stoked fear, to protect their greed and corruption and self-interest, and he knew the suffering that resulted from that. Rather than speak of theology in terms of speculative notions of God, Ballou spoke of it in terms of human experience here and now and our relationships to each other. A society that lives out the motive force of love would be one that fosters joy and liberation and thriving for all people. This is the highest calling of our faith as Unitarian Universalists, to live out, defend, and embrace this motive force of love in our lives, in our actions, in our commitments, and in our society. This is why you, you, the vote says vote love. Today, in our context, we are witnessing the emboldening and authorization of ideologies rooted not in love and interdependence, but in domination, authoritarianism, and dehumanization. And just to be clear, this is not new. It has a long and deadly history on this continent going back more than 400 years. And yes, even our universalist ancestors came from that same lineage of Christian European conquest and limited the vision of universalism only to white society a limit that we are tr still trying to redeem ourselves from. It is dehumanization that creates systems that put children in cages, that deny health care to our transgender siblings, that allow police violence and the murder of black people to continue unabated and without accountability. Dehumanization that allows triage protocols that devalue the lives of disabled people and that lead to systemic divestment from communities. The resources from housing to education, health care to jobs, and the criminalization of poverty. Just as Hosea Ballou named it, the tool of dehumanization, its propaganda is fear. Propaganda that tells us to fear our neighbor, that we are not family and kin, but enemies. 
This is the exact opposite of our theology of universalism that tells us that we have a common destiny and we are connected to one another in love. This is why you, you, the vote says vote, love, defeat, hate. And while the forces of dehumanization and domination have always been a part of U.S. history, so too have been those who have resisted and organized for the values of dignity, equity, humanity, and love. These days are heartbreaking, they're infuriating, and they're frightening. On days when I lose my own strength, I turn to the words of Alice Walker, who reminds us, we remember our ancestors because it is an easy thing to forget that we are not the first to suffer, rebel, fight, love, and die. The grace with which we embrace life in spite of the pain and the sorrow is always a measure of what has gone before us. We remember our ancestors, theological, familial, and in movement. We remember Francis, Ellen Watkins, Harper, Hosea Ballou, John Brown, Sitting Bull, Ida B. Wells, Dr. King, Anne Braden, and so many more whose names history does not remember. Those who struggled and risked and fought and loved for the principles of justice, equity, liberty. This is why in You, You, The Vote, we say vote love, we say defeat hate, because dear ones, we are on a precipice. Every single one of our most deeply held values is on the line right now. The current powers in government are showing in everything they do that the inherent worth and dignity of so many immigrants, black people, disabled folks, trans and queer people does not matter to them. Human agency, interdependence, the democratic process are being disrupted and defiled daily. It is a radical act of faith to not only continue to believe in all of our cherished principles, but to demand them by speaking out, taking risks, organizing, leveraging our resources and building networks of solidarity and power to protect one another and these values. We are on a precipice and our actions right now will affect whether we have a chance to continue to bring our bold values forward, to rebuild, expand, and strengthen our democracy, to confront police violence, to upend racial inequity, to change divestment from communities and make moves to protect the climate. Now is the time to draw on the grace, the courage, and the strength of all those who went before, to widen our comfort zones, and to do all we can to vote love and defeat hate. If you haven't taken any form of action yet, sign up for a shift with You, You, The Vote. I can tell you that it's fun. And if you've written postcards to voters, but you feel nervous about phone banking, do it with your fellow You, Yous. And if you've been all in with you, you, the vote from the beginning, keep it up and start planning for how you will show up and organize after November 3rd. Because democracy will not be restored in one election. It's been under systemic attack for decades. And justice will not roll down like waters in one election. Voting matters. It's absolutely critical. But it is not the end. It is just one piece of the long haul work of organizing for a future where all are free and where all can thrive. Will you show up in the streets, set up to contribute to a bail or legal assistance fund, open your church building to protesters needing refuge from state repression, tap into your own endowment or discretionary funds to make sure that grassroots organizers have the funds they need for their work. There is so much to do. And our faith calls us to love more radically, to give more generously, to believe more fervently that another world is possible and be willing to be all in for that future. As you've heard me say many times before, this is no time for a casual faith, no time for a casual commitment to what you hold most dear. And this is no time to go it alone. 
Friends, we are in this work together. I invite you to be deeper in this work of you, you, the vote with us. May we remember that we are held by love. May we remember that we are held by and with one another. And may we all together be all in today, tomorrow, next month, and next year for justice, for love, for democracy, and for a future that is free and thriving for all people. May it be so. Amen. Moments of tension and opportunity, such as this one, the lead up to an enormously consequential election, offer us the opportunity to claim our faith once again, to shape our opinions, our speech, our actions, and our energy around our deepest convictions instead of around the options available, seemingly available to us. We are allowed, actually, to put our faith at the center of our lives, to start with our deepest convictions, the things we know to be most true, most holy, most important and then to allow all of our decisions, our analysis, our actions, and our engagement with one another to flow from there. So voting, you are actually not obligated to vote. You are obligated though to use the tools at your disposal that you believe will help to repair the world. This is the covenant among us and with the source of life, that the blessing of life is a great unearned gift and that part of what we are here to do is to make some repair in the world. Unitarian Universalists believe in the democratic process. But let's not kid ourselves here. Felony disenfranchisement, gerrymandering, and the corporate influence in politics mean that we don't actually have a true democracy. The Electoral College is an incredibly undemocratic institution, and so too is the Senate. We don't have a true democracy. Some evidence for this is that half of the eligible population doesn't come out to vote every election cycle. It is roughly half of the entire eligible population. So if you are a regular voter and you have to consider in your life, how will I relate to the people who don't turn out? Consider that it's not because half the country is worse than you. People who don't care. People who, people who retreat into their privilege. People who are disengaged as if that's some sort of personal failure. Consider instead that many, many people feel despair. Many, many people are disgusted by our political process. And that might be some of you. I'm disgusted, I vote, but I'm disgusted. All of that is understandable. Voting is not a perfect tool. Voting in this election will not, like Reverend Susan Frederick Gray said, let the waters of justice roll down. 
That's not what it's about. When we vote, though, we choose the terrain of struggle. We choose the terrain, the political terrain, under which we will try in all other areas of our lives to bring about more love, more peace, and more justice. And it matters very much who is in which offices at the federal, state, and local levels. Imperfect and deeply flawed, though our electoral system may be. We can be clear-eyed about the process. We can be strategic in our engagement with people who do not at all have faith in the process. And we can get to work. My high school track coach would remind us, at the end of the race, we want to have left it all on the track. We don't want to save it for when the race is over. We don't want to save it for the last mile of a 5K. We don't want to save it for the 200 meter sprint to the end of the mile. We don't want to save it for the day before. We don't want to save it for Thanksgiving when we're really looking forward to arguing with our families maybe. We don't want to save it. We want to leave it all on the track in whatever way we can. So if that's poll monitoring, voting, which is the least of it, encouraging other people to vote, phone banking for partisan groups that you believe in, doing nonpartisan um, voter registration work, feeding your neighbors, giving money to our offering, which we'll tell you about in a minute because the city is resuming collecting payments on water and utilities. Leave it all on the track. This is the thing that we are called to do, not to seek perfection in the tools, the imperfect tools with which we try to repair the world. We ourselves are imperfect vessels of a love that is bigger than all of us. That we can channel it and we can use it and we can rest in it today and every day. May it be so, and amen.